לי לי די די דם, היי די, היי די די, היי די 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 דם. אוה חי נטו, הטו קר מסתתר, אוה חי נטו, הטו קר מסתתר. היי די, היי די די, היי די די די, היי די די די, היי די. די 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 דם, אוה חי נטו, תוקר מסתתר, אוה חי נטו, תוקר מסתתר, היי די 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 דם. אוה חי נטו. How are you, my holy sisters and brothers? That was not the usual big band, raucous sound that I'd like to open the show with, but that was Schwartzy himself. Uh, it's a video that I recorded, I think, about six years ago. We lost Rabbi Shlomo Schwartzy Schwartz, a dear, dear friend of our family and the entire Los Angeles Jewish community. Four years ago. Today is his yard site, and I'm dedicating today's episode of AT Daily to Schwartzy. And you're going to hear a wonderful Schwartzy story in a moment. Let's light up the darkness. Who is with us as we do a little learning and give over a Hasidic story about our very own Schwartzy? Here on AT Daily on a Monday night. Yehudit, says Erev Tov from Florence, South Carolina. Melissa in Great Neck. Stephen in New Hampshire. Samantha in Tacoma. Pauline in Arkansas. Bill says shalom everyone. Sandy in Michigan. Renee in Indianapolis. Hannah Rivka says Shavua Tov. A good week to you. Gwen Strong says Erev Tov. A good evening. John Shore wishing us shalom from a snowy Sedona. Rochelle Rosen in Modesto, Nancy in North Carolina, and in Merced, California. Paul in Chicago. Gwen says hi. Sandy from Southwest Michigan. Karen in Los Angeles. James says shalom. Pam in Nashville. Tom in Pennsylvania. Jim says shalom from Newport, Newport New Hampshire, and Michael in Scranton, PA. Uh, whoops, over there on the YouTube side, Joseph is with us from Lowell, Massachusetts, I believe, and Lynn in North Texas. Welcome, everybody. Great to be with you. As I mentioned at the top of the show, this is Schwartz's yard site. I do believe there would be no accidental Talmudist but for Schwartz. I've given over the story many times how I first reconnected with Judaism. It happened when my grandmother of blessed memory, Magda, uh, died, left this world. It was, I was at her bedside with my brother and my mom. It was a very, very powerful shared death experience. I, I, I saw her soul leave this world and rejoin uh, with her husband, her beshared, her soulmate, uh, who perished in the Holocaust, and she was waiting to be reunited with her husband, my grandfather, for 53 years. It was very moving. When I came back to Los Angeles, I, I was open. I was spiritually open, uh, and I wanted to explore. You know, I'd been a spiritual seeker all my life, not of other religions, but various practices, everything from martial arts and meditation to drumming, Grateful Dead shows. And what I hadn't really checked out on a spiritual level is our own tradition. So when I got back to L.A., uh, I, was, I, was, I was more open. I, I went to a synagogue, like the big kind of conservative synagogue that, that I grew up in, and that was powerful and that was good. But I was really looking for a, a, a mentor slash friend slash rabbi but somebody who didn't really fit the mold of the rabbis I'd grown up with. And my good buddy, Marvin Grossman, also of blessed memory, uh, from Taekwondo said, oh, you got to meet my neighbor, Schwartzy. Uh, and that's how I was introduced to him. And Schwartzy was just an institution. He, he came out as the first Chabad rabbi on a college campus at UCLA. I think he started that in the late 60s, early 70s. 
Um, and then, I mean, he just touched so many lives. So many Jews married each other because <laughs> he he was just obsessed with, you know, making Jewish babies, right? With with So that Jewish men and Jewish women would meet and form families and, and have Jewish families. Uh, and just so many Jews were lost from the world in the Holocaust. So many of his own family members. Uh, and and, and Schwartz, he was just obsessed with you know, so growing the Jewish population in the world and, of course, reconnecting Jews with Judaism. It meant the world to him. Uh, and so he and his wife, Olivia, and their uh, was it 12 or 13 kids uh, hosted so many Shabbos dinners. They used to say Shabbos dinner for 60 strangers in their homes, I think once or twice a month for, you know, decades. Uh, and so many people, myself included, you know, just when we were sort of finding our way back to Judaism, came to one of those dinners and it was so warm and the singing and the food and the cheer and the Torah and the enthusiasm for Torah and the Hasidic singing. And, you know, Schwartzy was red-haired, something I identified with as a redhead, but he had the long red beard. And, and he was hip, you know, he was the rabbi with, red, with rainbow suspenders and he spoke the language of rock and roll and, he, you know, he just was so warm and offbeat and unexpected and he always shared his enthusiasm for Torah, for Hasidus, for learning, for Jewish wisdom, for tradition, for mitzvahs in a way that just made you want to be part of it. He died four years ago. Today is his yard site. We remember uh, his legacy, his memory, his warmth. And I actually want to read you a story in his own words, right? So he used to send out these emails when he would tell various stories. This is kind of a famous Schwartzy story, uh, which is, he was actually at Woodstock, but not at Woodstock in 1969. You know, that area, Woodstock, where the concert was, is also a very Jewish area. A lot of the religious Jews from New York City would go up for the summers in that, in that part of the world. Uh, there are, of course, the famous sort of Jewish hotels, and, but also the religious community. And that's only grown in the decades since. Uh, but he wasn't at the concert in 1969. However, he was right nearby. He almost was there. Um, but 25 years later, in 1994, they did a Woodstock and Silver Anniversary concert, the 25th anniversary of Woodstock, and, uh, and Schwartzy was there and in Schwartzy style. So let me read you this story about the 25th anniversary and five rabbis who wanted to be there because it was around Rosh Hashanah and they were going to uh, enable all the Jews in the audience at the Woodstock reunion concert uh, to participate in the mitzvah of hearing the shofar uh, as Rosh Hashanah approached. Right, This was a couple weeks before Rosh Hashanah in 1994. This is Schwartzy telling the story. Most of us know that the most important mitzvah, commandment, of the Jewish New Year, also known as Rosh Hashanah, is to hear the shofar being blown. What most Jews do not know is that for an entire month before Rosh Hashanah, the shofar is sounded in the synagogue every morning. I, I'm, I'm reading this, I'm in Schwartz's voice now. I was actually at the famous Woodstock in 1969, but that's another very long but very exciting story. A quarter of a century later, in 1994, Woodstock 2 was going to happen in the same place. I got a call from a very, cre a very great creative rabbi in the Bay Area, I think that's Rabbi Langer, that five Hasidic rabbis were planning to attend Woodstock 2 and get on stage with 10,000 sweet apples and a shofar and explain in a short little sermonette what all of that was about. And then we would blow the shofar and throw the 10,000 sweet apples into the crowd. And there were hundreds of thousands of people there, but most of them would be able to get a bite. I told the Bay Area rabbi, that was never gonna happen. <laughs> he replied, 
Hey, they had a Woodstock sugar daddy, meaning some a philanthropist who was going to foot all the expenses of the 10,000 apples and that the rabbis could travel there. So what did I care? If it didn't happen, we would still have a great time meeting all those people. So just to, you know, uh, make sure this is clear. Five Hasidic rabbis are going to Woodstock 2, and their plan is to get on stage, blow the shofar, and hand out 10,000 apples in honor of Rosh Hashanah, which is coming up. And it's not like this has been cleared by the concert organizers. Just somehow God is going to make it happen. So, uh, okay. So, uh, where am I? So, off we went on a modern-day Hasidic adventure. We arrived at the site in the Catskill Mountains in two cars with the cases of apples and one huge Yemenite shofar. Like this. (laughs) Uh, We had a really great Shabbos. Sunday morning, we set out in a caravan of two cars with cases and cases of thousands of apples and us five rabbis. There were police checkpoints in a circular cordon two miles square to stop all vehicles. We had big blessings because every time we were stopped by the police, we just showed them all our apples and chanted the new mantra loudly. These are the apples for the stage. (laughs) After a moment of quizzical stares and facial expressions, they waved us through to the stage. I mean, so this is their ID. Thousands of apples, shofar, and their long beards. That's how they're going to get on stage. Uh, So they're hoping to get through to the stage. Eh, Not so simple yet. There were two checkpoints to stop everyone from getting on stage. So now we five rabbis are at the foot of the stage with our 10,000 apples. Suddenly a large burly man with a petite girlfriend hanging on his arm neither looked to be of the Jewish faith, approaches me and without any hello or even a smile, says, how much you want for the hat? Uh, How much you want for the hat? Now, I was wearing a baseball cap with a large chai on it, right? Chai meaning uh, uh, ches yud, right? The the word for life in Hebrew. And actually, Schwartz's organization was called the Chai Center. And he was famously, he always had that baseball hat with the chai on it. And if you were a supporter of the Chai Center, you could get that hat too. I have several inside. Uh, so, so I was wearing the cap, the baseball cap with the high on it, and I didn't understand what a non-Jew wanted with a high hat, but I didn't want to be that direct or confrontational and just come right out and ask him, are you Jewish? So I said, what's your Jewish name? The dude looked at me for a minute as if he was trying to remember his Jewish name. Meanwhile, his non-Jewish girlfriend pipes up proudly with, My Jewish name is Pesha Devosha. (laughs) Okay, so she is a Jew. At that moment, I noticed that among the many necklaces around him was an all-access pass. That means that he is a somebody. Uh, Soon, I find out that he's the roadie for Richie Havens, who was playing at the concert. A real somebody, super celebrity in the tradition of Woodstock. And then this guy with the tattoos, etc., asks the fateful question, what are you doing here? (laughs) I point to the cases of apples and explain that in two weeks, it's Rosh Hashanah, and the custom is to eat sweet apples in order to be blessed with with a sweet new year. So he says, follow me. I say, I have a group of another four rabbis. He says, okay, all of you follow me. We follow him onto the stage. We schlep all the cases of apples onto backstage. Okay, so now we're all backstage. Five Hasidic rabbis with the long beards, but we're dressed like them, right? They're not wearing the black coats, I guess. And 10,000 apples. We are having a really great time looking out from on the stage Uh, at about 300,000 enthusiastic rabble-rousers who are now staring back at us. However, the main objective has not been accomplished. We need to get the microphone and communicate our important message 
to all those non-Jews and some Jews who are mixed in among them. Suddenly, there's a big tumult. A very large black man, naked to the waist, very muscle-bound, looks like he's high on a bad trip, maybe PCP, somehow broke through both security checks and got on stage. The head of security, backed up by two humongous blue meanies, heavy, non-smiling killer giants, as Schwartz describes them, walks right up to the, the large black man and directly confronts him. At this point, I was thinking to maybe jump off the stage because it certainly seemed that violence was about to occur and I don't like the sight of blood. But, strange as it may seem, the black man seemed to reflect for a moment and then he slowly turned around and walked off the stage. Says Schwartzy, I wondered why I was supposed to see that. That's very important, by the way. This is Sal talking now. The way he said, Schwartzy thinks in that moment, why was I supposed to see that? Right? Everything that happens around us, the language is, is God speaking to us in the language of events. So everything is possible, you know, a message from the Holy One if we start picking up on the language. That's certainly how Schwartzy saw the world. Continuing. Uh, Schwartzy says, so I wondered why I was supposed to see that and what significance did it have for me and for us? So I walked up to the head of security. He looked at me quizzically like, what do you want? I said, I saw what you did in that potentially dangerous situation. You stopped the whole thing before it went anywhere. Then he smiled at me. At that instant, I somehow thought, He's an Israeli. So I started rattling off in speedy Hebrew. Where have you been all my life? I'm looking for you under the benches by candlelight. He smiled even larger and hugged me very strongly and affectionately. And then he said, dude, I didn't understand the word you said. I'm an Italian from the Bronx, but you're beautiful and I love you. And then he asked me the fateful question. What are you doing here? I pointed to the cases of apples and showed him the gargantuan Yemenite shofar and explained that we are rabbis uh, and we want to give the apples to the crowd and blow the ram's horn, well, the, <laughs> the, the, the kudu horn, and bless everyone with a sweet new year. And he asks, how long is it going to have to take? I answered, Four and a half minutes. He said, okay, you'll go on between Arlo Guthrie and Richie Havens. And that is what happened. It was the largest congregation I had ever spoken for before or since. We blew the shofar, threw out the 10,000 apples into the crowd. They loved it. Mission accomplished. <laughs> it's such a Schwartzy story. My dear friend Schwartzy, we miss you. It's been four years since you left this world and this shofar blast is for you. so much taken untimely early he was only 71 years old when he left this world but his spirit is so alive and so with us right now and he would love 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 that his guest at one of those friday night dinners who just didn't know anything uh, about observing judaism in fact i was so stupid when i went to that first friday night dinner and so ignorant, I brought a bottle of wine because I didn't want to come empty-handed, but it didn't even occur to me that it should be kosher wine. So I brought Shortsy this bottle of non-kosher wine. 
he, he recognized that immediately. He said, thank you so much. He put it off to the side. Very nice. Didn't make me feel embarrassed at all. And then we went into the dinner table and, you know, the non-kosher wine never made it to the dining room. But I'm glad to say that I was able over the 30 years that I knew him, or 20 years, how much long was it? It was closer to 30 years uh, that, uh, that we shared many a cup of wine. And we just miss Schwartzy so much. All right. Let's get to today's learning. And I'm saying, and he would just love that the guy who came in so ignorant is now teaching this Daf Yomi class, my second time through Shas, uh, and learning with this large group. I, I, my friends, it would just mean so much to Schwartz to know that you are engaged, that you are learning, that you're all accidental Talmudists with me, and that when you learn something that, that, that really inspires you, then you're going to find somebody else to share that Torah with. Schwartz, he would have just cavelled for that. He would have loved it. All right. So where are we holding? We're actually finishing the first volume of Tractate Pesachim, right? So this is, so Pesachim in, in the Koran Talmud, which is 42 volumes long. Uh, this tractate is divided into two, like a part one and part two volumes. So today we finished part one, and then tomorrow we'll start uh, part two of Pesachim. And this is volume seven of 42. So we're, you know, we're making some progress, right? We're starting volume seven of 42 volumes tomorrow. Uh, but today we're on page 65. Uh, that's Daf Samech He, page 65 of Tractate Pesachim. And we're completing chapter 5 by completing our discussion of the fifth Mishnah in chapter 5. Recall that we're talking about the Paschal lamb uh, and how they were actually slaughtered in the temple when the temple was standing in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So let's get into this. Uh, so it was stated in the next clause of the Mishnah, Mishnah number five that we've been examining, uh, that after the first group, right? So there were three groups. There, there, were, there, there were huge crowds of people who came to Jerusalem to enjoy Pesach, the Passover. Uh, and, and they would be registered as groups. Each group had its lamb or kid. And then the, the Paschal lambs would be slaughtered in the temple courtyard and they couldn't all fit in there at once. So there were three shifts. Why three shifts? Because the passage, uh, Exodus 12, 6, that alludes to this talks about uh, the assembly of the congregation of Israel. And the rabbis interpreted that as there would be three groups uh, in the temple. Uh, and there'd be the first group, the second group, and the third group. And that's what we're talking about. So it was stated in the next clause of the Mishnah that after the first group exited, the second group and then the third group would enter. It was taught in the Tosefta with regard to the third group. Uh, so the Tosefta is basically uh, contemporaneous with the Mishnah. It's the, the first, first sort of extra little bit of commentary on the Mishnah, but it was by the rabbis of the Mishnah. Uh, and it says in the Tosefta that, that the third group was called the lazy group because it was the last of the three groups. And the Gemara asks, but it would not have been sufficient without the third group, as the Paschal lamb must be offered in three shifts. What then should the members of the third group have done? In other words, if the people who come a little bit late uh, to this whole you know, ceremony at the Holy Temple when it stood in Jerusalem, and it has to be done in three shifts because the rabbi said so, that's according to the Torah, it has to be done in three shifts. So the ones who are a little bit late, okay, well, they're part of the third shift, but there needs to be a third shift. So why be critical of the people in the third shift? Somehow there has to be a third group. What, the ha what have they done wrong by being in the third group? That's the question being asked. Why were they called the lazy group? The Gemara answers. Nonetheless, the members of the third group should have hurried themselves so that they would not be in the last group. Now, this is in keeping with the Talmudic teaching we encounter all the time that when it becomes possible to do a mitzvah, you should do it as soon as it's possible, right? So you should really get up early in the morning and do your morning prayers as soon as it's daylight. And the afternoon prayers, you should do as soon as it's qualified to do the afternoon prayers. If possible, it's not always possible, right? And the evening prayers, as soon as it's evening. Of course, you could do it late. There's evening, you know, there's daily evening uh, Marv, like, you know, here in our neighborhood. I mean, not these days in COVID, but there's a, there's a Marv that's late, as late as I think 1045 in the evening. Obviously, they're not doing it at first opportunity possible. 
Although usually that, that the latest one is in a collab while people are studying all day. Uh, and it's because they were so busy studying that they delay doing the evening ceremony, the evening prayers a little bit. But as a general principle, it's good to do a mitzvah. It's good to fulfill a Torah obligation as soon as it becomes possible to do that. Uh, and so, so here it says that the, the Gemara is saying the members of the third group should have hurried themselves so they would not be in the last group. As it was taught in a Baraisa, the Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, also known as Rebbe, says the world cannot function without both the perfume merchant and the tanner, right? So the perfume merchant, obviously, he smells good. He's, he's mixing perfume all day. The tanner, this is the one who deals with, with cow hides and sheep hides and turning them into leather. But that process, especially in the ancient world, I mean, they had to deal with really disgusting liquids super smelly, right? It was just a kind of disgusting, difficult work uh, that most people didn't want to get involved with, right? Um, and, uh, and so says Rebbe, the world can't function without a perfume merchant or without a tanner who processes bad smelling hides. Now, while both of these occupations are necessary to society, fortunate is he whose profession is that of the perfume merchant And woe to him whose profession is that of the tanner. Of course, he's fulfilling a necessary function in society, but things are going to be difficult for him because, you know, to get that stench off at the end of the day is not easy. So if at the outset you can choose, better to be a perfume merchant than a tanner, right? That's what what Rebbe is saying. And likewise, the world cannot exist without males or without females. And yet, fortunate is he whose children are males, and woe to him whose children are females. Now, that sounds terrible to the modern ear, of course. Uh, Yes, this was written in a much more patriarchal culture. Uh, But in that world, economically speaking, it was was just so much easier to be a man. And the men, you know, were educated in Torah. The women, not so much. The men were study partners. The women had to be supported. And then a dowry provided at the time of the marriage, which is a big economic uh, you know, challenge, etc. We're not justifying the patriarchal society of 2,000 years ago. We're just understanding that's the context in which this statement was made. It was further stated in the Mishnah that in the same manner that the procedure involving the Paschal Lamb was performed during the week, so was it performed on Shabbos. And that even on Shabbos, the priests would rinse the floor. So now we're getting into a different uh, idea here. The first one was, okay, you know, if you have a choice between being the perfume merchant and the tanner, find a way to be the perfume merchant. We all have roles to play and all roles are necessary. But if you can, at the outset, when you're at a fork in the road, a a fork in the road, you can direct your steps toward, you know, more pleasant, more profitable, more, you know, easier occupations that are going to provide more time for Torah study, etc., better you should make the smart choices. Now we're on to a different question, uh, and this has to do with the fact that when all these lambs and, 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 and young goats were being slaughtered uh, on the afternoon of Erev Pesach before Passover started that night, uh, so the priests, you know, obviously there was a lot of blood in the courtyard from all the slaughtering and they would go through and rinse, you know, the, the, this marble and stone floor of the temple. Uh, was that permitted? And what if it was happening on Shabbos, right? Was it permitted if this, because the slaughtering of the Passover lamb, even though shechting slaughtering is definitely prohibited on Shabbos, would override the, pro, the Shabbos prohibition on slaughtering when the afternoon of Passover fell on Shabbos. Okay, so here's the question. Uh, Okay, so it was further stated in the Mishnah that in the same manner that the procedure involving the Paschal Lamb was performed during the week, so was it performed on Shabbos. And that even on Shabbos, the priests would rinse the floor of the blood, contrary to the wishes of the sages. That's what it said in our Mishnah. The Gemara asks, contrary to the wishes of whom? Which sage did not consent to this practice? Rachista said it was contrary to the wishes of Rabbi Eliezer, who maintains that rinsing the floor on Shabbos is prohibited by Torah law, as if one accepts the opinion of the rabbis who disagree with him, 
don't they say that rinsing the floor is prohibited only due to a rabbinic decree? And as we've learned before, Torah laws are the same everywhere, whether in the temple or outside the temple. Rabbinic decrees, for the most part, do not apply in the temple. Why? Because the general concept of a rabbinic decree is a fence around the Torah that distances us from coming to violate a Torah law, right? It it's distances us from coming to, to, uh, to, you know, to violate those prohibitions and to transgress and to commit a sin. But the priests were already very diligent and very well versed in Torah, and they didn't need these additional decrees from the rabbis telling them what to do. They, they had it covered, as it were. Uh, 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 uh. So as, okay, so where am I? Do not apply in the temple. Consequently, it should be permitted to wash the floor in the temple on Shabbos according to the opinion of the rabbis. Only according to Rabbi Eliezer would it have been prohibited to rinse the floor on that afternoon before Pesach when that afternoon falls on Shabbos itself. The Gemara asks, what is the source of this dispute? The Gemara answers, as it was taught in the following Baraisa. One who milks an animal, or sets milk to curdle, or makes cheese, on, is liable, if he does this on Shabbos, he is liable if he performed the activity in the measure of a, of a, of a dried fig bulk. Uh, and one who sweeps the house, or sprinkles water on the floor, or removes honeycombs, if he did so unwittingly on Shabbos, he is liable to bring a sin offering. Meaning these are all... Uh, violations of Torah law, not rabbinic decrees, right? Because on Shabbos, we're pr prohibited to do the 39 categories of work. Uh, so milking an animal, that's actually considered uh, like uh, harvesting in the same way that if you cut, um, you know, you, you, you harvested wheat or you harvested fruit from a tree, right? Like you're pulling, fr you're pulling food off of a plant on Shabbos, that's harvesting, that's a Torah violation, a violation of a Torah law. If you milk an animal, it's considered a subcategory of harvesting because you're drawing milk out of an animal on Shabbos. If you set the milk to curdle, that's also violating a Torah law. It's a subcategory of the general category of selecting, right? No, normally when we're a farmer is, is, is uh, selecting, meaning separating the wheat from the chaff, etc., or any kind of selecting. It's just part of the work of the week and it's prohibited on Shabbos. Or somebody who makes cheese on Shabbos, this is very interesting, right? So you set the, 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 the liquid milk to harden into cheese. What is that? That's building. That's considered a subcategory of the prohibited category of building. Uh, if you remove honeycombs, uh, now if you sweep the house or sprinkle water on the floor or remove honeycombs, if he did so unwittingly on Shabbos, he's liable to bring a, a sin offering. So again, this has to be uh, Torah violations. So removing a honeycomb, that seems to be like harvesting. Uh, and if you are sweeping the house, right, if you sweep a dirt floor, that's the issue here. When you sweep a dirt floor, there's going to be little holes in the floor that get filled in. And that's like construction, right? That's filling in holes. Uh, that, that's part of construction when you're filling in holes. And that's prohibited on Shabbos. Uh, ba -ba -ba. And if he did so intentionally on a festival... Right, so it's the same laws that you can't do work, except you are allowed to cook on a festival, but everything else is the same. So if you did this intentionally on a festival, you're flogged with 40 lashes. This is the statement of Rabbi Eliezer. So being flogged with lashes for doing it on a festival, that would indicate that it's a rabbinic decree rather than a Torah law. Perhaps. Is that what it means? Let's see. And the rabbis say with regard to the cases of sweeping, sprinkling water on the floor, and harvesting honeycombs, both this, performing the actions on Shabbat, and that, doing so on a festival, are prohibited only due to rabbinic decrees. Right. So Eliezer is saying those are actually violating Torah laws. The rabbis are saying, no, these are actually rabbinic decrees. They're not you know, like taking the honeycomb out. You know, it's not the same as harvesting. And, uh, and sweeping the floor and sprinkling with water, not the same as violating a Torah law. It's still prohibited rabbinically, uh, but it's not a full-fledged Torah violation. Why does it matter whether it's rabbinically prohibited or prohibited by Torah law? 
because rabbinic prohibitions don't apply in the temple. So according to Rabbi Eliezer, rinsing the floor, which the priests were doing on the afternoon uh, when Passover begins on Saturday night and they're slaughtering all the lambs on Saturday afternoon while it's Shabbos, there's blood on the floor and the priests want to keep it clean. And so during the a normal day, not uh, during a weekday, they would certainly be rinsing the floor and they do it the same way on Shabbos, even though Rabbi Eliezer would have said, don't do that. Uh, so according to Rabbi Eliezer, rinsing the floor is the same as sweeping the floor. Therefore, it is prohibited on Shabbos, even in the temple, as there is no allowance to perform a labor prohibited by Torah law that is not essential for the proper sacrifice of the offerings. Right. So it is definitely a Torah prohibition to sweep a dirt floor. It's a rabbinic decree not to sweep a wood floor or a marble floor. Now, you might think that sweeping is not so bad. I mean, you just want it to be clean for Shabbos. Uh, and, and generally, that is okay. But in certain situations, the rabbis would prohibit that because you might come to sweep a dirt floor. Once it became very common for, like, most people don't have dirt floors, then I think that that, that, that decree was rescinded. I, that's just, I'm recalling that. I haven't actually looked that up right now. I could be wrong, but I, I think that's how it went. Ravashi said, you can even say that the priests, and now I'm almost done. So if you have questions or comments about the Schwartzy story that I told earlier or what we're reading here as we finish chapter five uh, of Tractate Pesachim, please put in the comments. I'm coming to it now. Ravashi said, you can even say that the priests rinsed the floor contrary to the wishes of the rabbis who hold that the prohibition is due to rabbinic decree and that the Mishnah is according to their opinion of Rabbi Nassim. As it was taught in a Baraisa, in a Baraisa, Rabbi Nassim says that a rabbinic prohibition that is absolutely necessary to violate for a sacrificial rite in the temple, they permitted that in the temple, right? They would, the, the rabbinic decree wouldn't apply. However, a rabbinic prohibition that is not necessary to violate in order to perform the sacrificial rite, they did not permit in the temple. Rinsing the floor is not essential as the temple rite can continue even if the floor is not washed. Therefore, this rabbinically prohibited activity was not prohibited, was not permitted in the temple. That's according to Rabbi Nassim. And we look at the halacha. Uh, it says that one who sweeps or sprinkles. It is prohibited to sweep a dirt floor on Shabbos, lest one fill in holes in the ground. However, one may sweep a tiled floor. In addition, rinsing a floor is prohibited on a festival and certainly on Shabbos. Okay, so rinsing is different than sweeping. Uh, and one who does either violates a rabbinic decree in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis. And so we don't have a final answer there on, uh, you know, who, who... I mean, it seems like the rabbis did permit... Uh, the, 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 that, that the priests would rinse the floor. It was only Eliezer who would object to that on Arab Pesach. At any rate, we study these laws and we're waiting for the third temple to be rebuilt so that we can actually start observing them in the real world practically. All right, let me come to your questions and comments. Here we go. Uh, regarding the third group that came late and are regarded as, and are referred to as the lazy group, Michael Diamond says, well, maybe they all arrived at the same time, but only one third could be admitted at a time. For sure. If everyone arrived early, uh, then they would still have to assign them into third group to three groups. And then there would not be uh, one, to, it wouldn't be a group called the lazy group, right? They came to be called that perhaps because, you know, People knew that they could be late. I mean, let's face it. I don't think there's any uh, house of worship where everyone arrives on time when the services start. I don't know. Maybe in other traditions. I can't speak for other traditions. But in synagogues, <laughs> you know, maybe if you're lucky at the appointed hour, you've got the 10 guys who, for the minion to be there so that you can get started with the service. But there's always latecomers. There's just some people who count on being late. They don't mind. They don't even mind being called part of this lazy group, as it were. Uh, with respect to this idea that, that 2,000 years ago, girls were less desirable, Sharon says, but at the time of the Talmud, a man paid the father for the ketubah to marry. Father's paying a dowry was much later. 
the ketubah afforded security for the bride. Uh, well, let's see. I mean, the ketubah is an agreement by the, by, I guess, by the, by the, the groom, right? The groom and I, and I guess his family that if she's divorced, she won't go away empty handed. Um, I guess the dowry is much later, but at, at any rate, there were, you know, it, it, for whatever reason, I mean, and there, there were many in that patriarchal culture that they, they preferred to have boys. I would say, sadly, you know, the, the well into the 20th century in many places in the world, people still felt that way. Uh, but as a father of both son and daughter, uh, I can say that, you know, my, my heart, you know, is just filled with love for both of my children in equal measure uh, and no, making no distinction between boys and girls for me. Sharon also says, since we learned that intention is so important, how can one have a good intention on a blood-soaked floor? I mean, it's interesting because also on this page, I mean, we're not going to just discuss every paragraph there, but it also does say that one reason that there was objection to rinsing off the floor, uh, and they didn't fully rinse off the floor because the fact that so many um, Paschal offerings were brought in the temple was sort of like a sign of, of how devoted the children of Israel remain, right, thousands of years or, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the exodus from Egypt to still recalling it. And, and, and here we are still. We can't bring sacrifices since the temple's been gone 2,000 years. But the Passover Seder, uh, I'm pretty sure, is the most universally observed uh, custom in Judaism, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Hanukkah candles get even more Jews participating. Uh, but something like 75% uh, of Jews, uh, you know, honor Passover in some one way or another, which is, which is a wonderful thing. And, uh, and so this idea that, you know, there was a lot of blood on the ground, I mean, they were just much less squeamish than we are. They didn't think of it as gross. They thought of it as, you know, all these people brought what is most valuable to them, an animal, uh, in that culture, uh, and were willing to sacrifice it, uh, you know, put some of the blood on the altar, and then to actually the, the the Paschal lamb is eaten. It's it's roasted whole and then eaten, but eaten according to very particular rules, as we remember that God heard our cries and our anguish and our suffering when we were enslaved in Egypt and took us out of there with a, str- a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Uh, so the idea that a lot of these sacrifices were brought and that there was blood on the floor is not something really that grossed them out. It just meant that, you know, beautiful. So many people are, are worshiping and are, and, are, and are honoring the holiday and honoring the memory. Uh, now we have a different relationship with, the, with those kinds of customs. And, you know, maybe as Rambam said, that's why it was, it, it was sort of phased out, <laughs> out of history uh, by God's will. And, and here we are 2,000 years later honoring Passover very much with the elaborate seders that we have, uh, even though we don't have to deal with the blood at all. Right now we have the four cups of wine, we have the matzah, we have the bitter herbs, we tell the whole story. And then we have a nice dinner uh, that does not include lamb by tradition. In some some parts of the Jewish world, they actually do eat lamb, but the vast majority will not eat lamb. And that's actually in deference to this tradition. And finally, uh, Lynn says, I thought the bare feet of the priests on the wet stone flooring would be a real danger and impossible to walk safely. The note that there were platforms above the floor was surprising, right? Well, the, the note there, as Lynn is mentioning, is that when there was a lot of blood on the ground, there was a concern that see, the priest had to officiate in bare feet. They always fulfilled the, the rites in the temple in their bare feet. And it was considered that if something came between their feet and the floor of the temple, uh, then that would disqualify the offerings that they were bringing. They had to serve in bare feet. So on, on the afternoon before Passover, when there was all this blood in the temple courtyard, did that count as an interposition between them, their feet and the temple floor, which would disqualify all those offerings? And the sages answer, no, because that blood is in liquid form. Blood does interpose. For example, if you have dry blood on your body because you, you, know, you had a cut and then you got some dry blood on you uh, and you're a, a woman having mik- going to mikvah once a month, for family pure for the marital purity laws, or if you're a convert and you're going to immerse in a mikvah, 
uh, as you're commanded to do in order to join the Jewish people. If you have dry blood on your skin, that is an interposition between your skin and the, and the purifying waters of the mikvah. But liquid blood is not considered an interposition. It's just there was a few drops of blood in the mikvah. It's okay. Uh, it doesn't disqualify that immersion. Uh, and finally, this will be the last question. Joseph asks, uh, did the Kohanim have more Torah prohibitions instead of rabbinic? Well, the idea is the Kohanim, there are so many laws in the Torah that only a priest in the temple can fulfill, right? All the laws of the sacrifices, I mean, you know, people can bring the sacrifice, they can bring the animal to the temple, but then all the process that's done in the temple has to be done by the priests and only the priests can do it. So there's just hundreds of laws uh, that since the temple was destroyed, we as a people can no longer fulfill. We study them, but we cannot fulfill them. Since the priests were involved in fulfilling so many laws, they had to be highly educated with respect to those laws. And really, you know, the idea of the sages uh, and directing, you know, the, the Jewish people as, as their rabbis, really that was late in the game, right? The, the period of the sages begins somewhat late in the second temple period, while the temple is still standing, um, but late in that period. And it was really because there was a lot of corruption going on in the temple and, and the priests in that time, some of them had become quite corrupted. Um, but prior to that, uh, for you know the, the sort of first thousand years uh, of the Jewish people, once we're in Israel, uh, you know the, the ones who were really the guardians of Torah and Torah knowledge were the priests because they had to know so much Torah in order to fulfill their obligations, and so that's why the rabbis are going to exercise a very light touch in telling the priests how to fulfill their functions. Uh, because they're already quite quite Torah savvy and know what to do, and they've learned that you know, and their families have been involved in that, had been involved in that already for hundreds of years. Still, there were certain uh, you know rabbinic prohibitions that would apply in the temple. It's just that the majority of rabbinic prohibitions did not, and certainly not if they would interfere with the work of the priests, as we learned today. <clears throat> Any rabbinic decree that it was necessary to violate in order to fulfill the, oblig the priestly obligations in the temple, they would certainly violate the rabbinic decree. And generally speaking, the rabbinic decrees were issued to protect the regular folks like you and me from coming to violate Torah prohibitions in our daily lives. That's what I've got for us tonight. With God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific, the regular time on Tuesday as we open up part two uh, and page 66 of Tractate Pesachim. All the best and good night.